All right. Well, welcome everybody. So who here is this their very first ApacheCon? All right. We got some new folks. Are you guys having a good time? All right. So uh, I'm so excited that you guys came to my talk because this talk is really about how you can bring this experience home with you. Um, so if you're having a good time here, uh, my goal is to give you guys the tools and the knowledge of why you might want to get involved in user groups, what you can do with user groups, and how user groups uh, may benefit you um, as an ASF committer, contributor, or just even just somebody interested. Um, so we'll start off with just a little bit about me. So I'm an independent consultant from Chicago. Um, so it's actually warm there right now, so I actually don't have that much of a bump in the temperature. Um, I've been an ASF member for about a year now. Um, my work, I was recently uh, made a Java champion, which essentially is um, I'm involved in a Java user group, and as part of my work with the group, we do a number of programs, which I'm going to talk about with you today, um, which led to my election into that uh, body of people. Um, I'm currently the CFO of the Chicago Java User Group. So we're one of the largest uh, organizations in Chicago for the user group community. Um, so, um, yay. Um, and I'm also a podcaster. I do two different podcasts. So if you're interested in technology and learning about Java and how the JVM works, um, the Java Pub House podcast is one I do with Freddie Gimme, where we go deep into um, different things in the JVM. We go into how to write um, software using a lot of different open source libraries. And it's really you know, kind of an approachable podcast if you're just getting into Java and you want to learn uh, new things about the language. The other one off heap is more of the pundits podcast. Who's, who here has heard of the Java Posse? Anybody heard of them? OK. Not a whole lot. They're, they've been gone for some time now, but it's basically a pundits podcast where we talk about news, things in open source, you know, like the, you know, the Google Oracle lawsuit and things that are relevant for the JVM there. Um, so these are things that I've been working on um, for the past couple of years, but most recently I've been working uh, on an app. So um, recently went into production about a month and a half ago. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. This is my app. So you know, we've been working on it for about nine months. He's in production, he's doing great. And this is what this talk is really about as well. It's about building for the future, building for people that are going to be using open source 20, 30 years from now, because what it ends up coming down to is it's all about community. Um, and this guy is an MVP. He does three things very well. He eats, he sleeps, and he poops very well. Those are the three things. And we're going to build a community um, around different things um, for Apache. Um, so let's talk about you. Um, so who here has been, is involved with an Apache project? If you've got a lot of folks, expected a lot of folks, great. Um, who here also attends user groups? OK, so we got some user group folks. Who thinks user groups are all about drinking beer and socializing? No, really? Nobody? OK, Tom, I knew I'd get Tom. But who here is like, wait, there's beer and pizza at these things? How do I, can you do a talk about that? Because I want that. Um, really, nobody? You guys have already figured out the beer thing then. All right, well, I've got tips on that later as well. Um, so is anybody involved in like, the actual running of a user group? Ah, OK, got a few folks. Perfect. So this is my ideal audience. Folks that go to user groups are involved in Apache and um, are at my talk, so you might be interested in doing more. All right, so when I was looking to write this talk, I kind of started off with this philosophical question about, you know, how did I get here? How did we get here um, becoming ASF members? Um, at the end of the day, you think back to when you get into, a, into Apache or how you got involved, and it's really, you think about it, it's very much a revisionist history. We, we kind of reinvent how we got in and, or how difficult it was and what it, felt like um, getting into the organization. Um, sometimes we'll forget you know, if it was a specific JIRA or if there was a specific person involved. And what I like to do is try to get back to that and try to bring you back to that experience and think of how it was and think of, were there, is there easier ways that that could have happened for you? 
And then think back on the impact that it had on your life in getting involved in the ASF. You know, for many of us, it was a pretty big deal, pretty big career thing for our careers. It could have just been a big thing for us socially or just our self-esteem, having that um, you know, either member, committer, contributor, having a patch in. Um, it, it feels really good, right? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get that out to more people. So when you think about what we're, try what we're trying to do here, what it makes the ASF special to us? So I mean, as a code, of course, we produce code. Um, is it the process, the process where we have community over code in our, in our uh, ecosystem? Is it the, the fact of how we do releases? Is it that? Is it the brand? Is it the fact that we have this brand of what Apache makes that is unique and, and is, is difficult to replicate? Well, when you're thinking of what an organization is about, it usually comes back to the mission statement. And when you start with Apache, you're making software for the public good. So we're all just altruists, right? That's, that's really all there is to this. We're just trying to do good at, by, by creating open source software. Well, if you keep reading, there's an, there's an additional spot to this, where we're, it talks about providing services and support for the people, like, for many like-minded software projects and communities. So, I mean, if you think open source is important, the foundation's goal is to support those like-minded people and to bring them together. The organization, the foundation, is really about growing people and growing communities. So in order to serve that, um, you know, kind of like my app, we're trying to grow people that are maybe getting into open source or maybe they're just trying to figure out the way to get in and have them have a successful experience with that. Um, you know, specifically, you know, people that were trying to produce useful software with these communities, so growing them is extremely important. But often, the part we forget is how hard it was to get in. Or maybe it was easy for you, but maybe that's revisionist history. Because when we think about what we did to take that first step, there's kind of a survivorship bias. You know, the people that got in, well, you're already in, so must have been something I did right, right? Sometimes we don't even know what we were actually doing properly that, that got us into what we're doing right now. And we forget about all of these other things that go on that maybe are resistance to people trying to get into open source. You know, when you sent off that first pull request or that first patch in a JIRA, um, you weren't really sure what was going to happen with it most of the time. You're just waiting for somebody to bring back judgment or perhaps tell you what they, well, maybe this and, and do this differently. And you know, there's cases where perhaps some encouragement or some things along the way would have, um, and, and maybe we didn't even notice it, that was very important. But we all got past it. Um, and the people in this room and the people that are involved with the ASF have um, kind of a, a, have some sort of status, or you could call it just a, kind of an achievement that not a lot of people have, right? So if you look at your general user group community and you walk around and talk to people, how many people that you run into that are ASF committers, that are ASF members? You're kind of in the minority. So people are looking to you and, that, and you have something that a lot of these people in user groups want. Um, so keep that in mind. And when you're working with people and that are saying, well, well, how did you get into it? You know, the first thing that came out of my mouth just when, when people ask this question is, well, you gotta go join the mailing list, you know, get involved in the mailing list. And, um, you know, when that comes out, you know, you do think about back and you're like, well, I just got involved in the mailing list and, uh, you know, everything just kind of worked out from there. Um, but people forget what getting introduced to a mailing list feels like, right? Often, you're not really sure what that reply is going to look like. Is somebody going to come and tell me that, oh, what I'm doing is not really what we want to do in this project? Um, it leaves open to chance that that person may have a good or a bad experience. Um, and again, it's because we're thinking in terms of we're this distributed group of software engineers and, um, you know, we don't always have a local face-to-face -face community to bring us together to help people through some of these things that they would be facing on their own. So what we really need 
is an incubator for people. We have incubators for software, but we need incubators for people to help people cross that large chasm that's sometimes there between somebody that's just a casual open source user to a committed open source committer member that's contributing back and providing value to their community. So, you know, how, how do we bring these people together so that we can help them cross this chasm? And a lot of times it is just having some support there um, for these people to, to learn how to uh, contribute properly to open source and engage the community in ways that we've all learned, but is not necessarily that intuitive. So here's where user groups can help. And this is, this is my pitch to the Apache community. Um, because with beer and pizza, we can fix anything, right, as developers. That's the only two inputs we really require. Um, and user groups, because nobody else raised their hand for the beer question, I'm assuming you're getting that. Um, so what we can do with user groups is create incubators for people within the user groups. You know, user groups allow face-to-face -face interactions between developers, which takes some of the sting out of something coming from the other side of the world over the internet. Um, it is a low bar of entry, right? For me to go to a user group, I don't have to do anything. I just have to sh sign up and show up um, and take time out of my day to go to that user group. And it's usually because I have some sort of itch that I wanted to scratch. Maybe I'm not getting something that I, that I wanted to out of my work environment. And you can meet like-minded developers there. And when you think about the average user group attendee, there's a lot of overlap between what we're looking for in people that are committed to the ASF. So my first experience going to a user group was I was at a place, we were building software, they were still using very outdated stack, a lot of it was Kix and COBOL and open source was sort of used but not really. And you know, the company was, as a developer of their technology people, they didn't always have um, resources that could help you grow your career. So I started looking outside to other places that were available to me. And one of those were the, was the Java user group. Um, and in going to the Java user group, I started finding those people that I could engage on conversation. And at the very first time, it was like, wow, these people are so much smarter than me. They're doing all of these cool things with all this new technology. Uh, how do I do more of that? So, being brought into that community um, already kind of, you know, it kind of pulled me in. Um, these people are already interested in doing things after work. User groups don't happen during the day. They're kind of inconvenient. You know, if you're just trying to work and go home, um, it's like two hours and then if you have a commute, you're spending more time either in the city or wherever you're working to go to these user group meetings. So, People already interested at work, generally, that's, that's a good thing for ASF projects. You're looking to be a part of something. Like I said, as, as I was working through my work environment, I wanted to be a part of something else um, that was important to me. And then finally, they usually have an itch. Like, they're selecting a user group for a reason. It's like, I wanted to be a better Java developer, or I want to, be, to learn something about Go, or I want to learn something about Apache Spark. Um, you have user groups there that are specific, that can teach you specific things, and I can self-select which of these things that I want, very much like an Apache project. So great, hopefully I've made some compelling argument that user group folks are people that we actually want to go out and actively recruit into our projects. Um, as an ASF member, committer, contributor, um, what is it that I have that I can offer people in the user group community? The very first thing that we can provide is often speaking about the topics at the user groups. User groups, many of them are, are hurting for speakers. They're always looking for somebody to provide content. And um, Apache members, committers, contributors, are usually the best types of speakers because they're not ones pushing some sort of a white paper, right? You're, you become an Apache committer or contributor by submitting patches and actually getting to know the code base. And we have one kind of basic rule 
at the, the Chicago Java user group and what we want out of our speakers, and that is when you give a talk, whether it's proprietary or open source, no matter what, I should be able to learn something without having to pay you anything to learn that thing. I should be able to take home something that you taught me and work on it at home without having to go through some sort of a paywall. Apache's projects already fit that definition. So we happen to do a lot of talks on Apache. Um, and you don't have to do it all yourself. You know, the one great thing about being a part of a community of developers is you have contacts within your community, within other communities that are maybe related and integrating with your project. So if it's like, well, I'm in the, you know, the Karaf community. Well, Karaf has integrations with Camel, and we really want a Camel talk. Can I post something out to look for somebody that's a Camel contributor to come in and give a talk? Oh, and Camel integrates to everything. So, well, now I want PDF box. Now I want Tika. Now I want, you know, I can branch out from there in order to make those connections that a lot of these user group leaders may not have without being fully engaged in open source. The other thing is mentorship. Again, when we talked about crossing that chasm of becoming, going from an open source user to an open source contributor, um, most people just have no idea where to get started or what the expectations are. People that actually have sent patches into open source that kind of feel dejected by it, it's usually like, well, I put this pull request out there, but nobody's looking at it. Nobody's doing anything with it. So everybody must hate me or they don't like what, what I put out there. Um, and that's usually not the case because teams have projects, right? They're, they have processes in place of what it, you're supposed to do in order to commit code to the repository. And somebody that is aware of these kind of policies or can point people in the right direction can kind of say, well, okay, did you, did you mention something on the dev list? You know? Did you read some of the conversations that happened before? Maybe this was something that was raised before and um, you know, they came up with a reason why the community did not want this specific feature. Um, the other thing that often comes up is, you know, what should I work on? You know, is there a specific project out there that I should be, that I should be watching? And you know, being involved um, in some of the other projects out there in Incubator is you kind of have some inside baseball on what's going on and who's looking for people to help out. And in, in, and in truth, everybody's looking for people to help out, right? We all want more people in our communities. But often there's specific skill sets that people have that may benefit one community or another. Like, so what are you using at work, right? Maybe that's something that you could look into. What is your work? You know, do you even have a job that may make being an open source contributor um, difficult so, so that they don't put themselves in a position. Maybe they have an employment contract where the employer owns everything. Um, you know, at least having that conversation and making people aware of, of different things that are going to happen if they do get involved um, can be important if you can have them up front. You know, one of the things that I had with another uh, member of the CJUG is they were like, well, you know, for your Apache projects, you don't have to like, like, if you take a patch from somebody else, there's no agreement that that person that you took the patch from had to sign. It's just the committers that sign it. So what happens if what they gave you is something that's bad? And I'm like, oh, there should be something on that. And I get, went through the list, and it's like, well, if you're the one applying the patch, you are kind of have some responsibility for that. So it's like, well, I'm glad that I read up on that before just applying patches, just in case I thought that, hey, I'm off the hook, you know, I'm just, I'm just committing it to the repo, this guy gave it to me. Um, so, you know, having people there that are able to guide people is very, very important. Um, and we're all, everyone in this room is, is, is a good candidate to, be, to do that type of mentoring. The other thing is street credibility. So like I mentioned, there's not, if you go to a user group anywhere, you're not necessarily going to find a lot of other people that are committers and members of the ASF. So in general, you may get kind of looked up to in these communities and, and kind of be able to serve as a role model to people. So they're gonna look to you at how you interact on your, on, with your communities, how you interact with people in person, um, 
and this can, you know, this can get you some, some street credibility. You know, when I go around the meetup and talk about things that are going on in the, on, on projects and, and, you know, things, things that I've done, you know, I don't think some of them are really that big of a deal anymore, but people that haven't done this to them, it's like a huge deal. It's like, wait, you, you contributed to a project and people are running your code like at all of these companies, that's, that's pretty awesome. And we sometimes forget, oh yeah, that is pretty awesome. Um, so the street credibility thing, you know, we can be role models in these, in these user group communities and, and people to model off of. All right, so who's ready to do this, right? Nobody? Okay. Tom, are you ready to do this? He's thinking about it. <laughs> All right, so let's get into the meat of this. Is, is what, how, how does this stuff work? And if I want to get involved in it, what is it exactly you're asking me to do? Um, so the first thing is just selecting a group. And some of this comes down to you know, what you want to be involved in. In Chicago, we have a ton of user groups. Um, we have groups that we've, these are just some of the ones we've worked with. Um, the, the Chicago Women's Developers Group, which is again, just kind of focused on on, on women developers, uh, the, the Chug is the uh, Hadoop user group. As you can see, they've solved the beer issue as well. Um, there's the Chicago ACM, DevOps. You've got choices. So which one should I pick? They're not all created equal. So you, you kind of have to maybe go to a few and, and, and figure out what you're looking for. Just like in the ASF, User groups often get stuck with this. There's some user groups out there that under the guise of an open source user group or a language-based user group are really just marketing departments of some corporation that's either looking for recruitment or looking to market a product. Um, my suggestion is to avoid these. Um, if, if you go to these meetups or get involved with them, you're going to find that most of it is just a big sales pitch. Um, and, and it's usually very, very obvious from the onset what those are um, because you'll go in and you'll get pitched immediately and you won't see any code and you won't be able to take anything home with you. It'll violate all of the rules that we have for speakers. The other decision you have is do you want to be in a specific group or a general group? Um, so one of the things that happens if you have a really rich ecosystem, um, so Chicago I think has a really rich one, is you'll have like a user group for something very, very specific. Like we'll have a user group just for a specific open source. Like a, there's a user group just for Hadoop. Now they've branched out because the Hadoop ecosystem is now huge. Um, but you know, at the time, if it's just Hadoop, you can kind of get siloed into one specific technology stack. And maybe that's what you want. There's also groups that are general and cover a lot of things. Our, the CJUG is more of a general group. Where we'll cover anything on the JVM. Um, the thing with gener generality is a lot of times you'll get different people each meetup depending on what you're presenting on and you don't get a lot of cohesion with the people that are coming in. You want kind of regulars coming in so that you can start getting a relationship with people. Um, otherwise, you know, mentoring the same first person you know, 20 times in a row is not really that effective. You want to start building a community where the same people show up. The other thing is you want people that you can work with. So meeting with the people running the group and figuring out, you know, what they're doing this for and what's important to them is very important with figuring out if you're gonna get heavily involved in user group because it does take time. It's just like working on a project where sometimes you get kind of hooked on it because you're, you're able to talk to speakers and you're able to um, talk with companies and find out what everybody's doing. Um, you're going to spend a lot of time with people if you get involved with them on, on a board or, or actually in the running of the group. Okay, so now if you've signed up, what are some things that are helpful? And these are kind of tips that that we've found along the, the years of how to run the this, CJUG this successfully. You know, we have about 2,500 members. We've been doing it for probably the last five or six years. Um, you know, what makes user groups successful and what can I do in order to get, you know, the free beer every week and, and to have a group of people that as I mentor, as we grow, 
can start becoming and influencing and doing good things in the ASF as well. The first thing, again, back to getting speakers. And one of the things that, to think about is think big. Um, one of the really crazy things when you're thinking about asking someone to speak is we usually think in terms of us, it's like, man, I'm really asking this person to do a huge favor for me. Um, the big secret about speakers is they like to do this. They like to come up in front of people and talk, especially user groups, because if the, if the speaker is writing a book or trying to run a conference, or you know, they're, they're trying to do some self-promotion for themselves, speaking is what gives them the opportunity to do that. By thinking big, um, you're going to bring in the, or at least give yourself the opportunity to bring in the top-notch talent. The one thing that we decided right off the bat with the C-Jug is that we wanted the content to be the best it possibly could. Nothing else would really matter. As long as we had really good content, we would, all the other things would fall into place. One of the things that happens, though, if you get too focused on getting the big names, is you forget about your local community. And the, the goal is to have a good mix of speakers. Um, so one thing we started doing in order to try to engage other people and, and bring people in our community, so when we go to conferences, we have people there that we know right off the bat, um, is encouraging lightning talks and getting regular members to come up and talk about some of the technology they're using, you know, the last project they did at work. Um, and we've found this really effective in not only recruiting new members to our, um, to our board, but getting people more involved in the jug and to, to care about what we're doing in the user group. So assuming you can find somebody to talk, the next hardest thing is getting the venue for them to talk in. And this was, was our biggest challenge because as it turns out, there's a lot of good speakers in Chicago that we just didn't even know about until we started asking. Um, and we were lucky for the first couple years when we were doing this because we had one place that would just give us space and pizza and beer and, and life was good. But then their budget dried up and they said, well, we can't really do this for you anymore. Um, so we were run into a tailspin. It's like, what do we do? And we talked to a place that said, well, yeah, we can cover you for next month. Um, but the month after that, yeah, we don't know. So we kept moving to different places. And one of the things that we discovered was that by moving it around, as long as you stay in a similar proximity, is a really healthy thing for your community. Because what we pitch now to our members is if you're looking for a job, you're looking to understand you know, what kind of work is going around in the Chicago area, you just have to come to CJUG. Because we're going to keep moving around to all the people and companies that are willing to support the community and provide space for people to gather and have these sort of activities to happen. Um, so really, it's this huge win-win that you're looking to focus on when you're looking for, for venues. Um, you get to offer and say, well, company, you're going to have developers coming in, and you're, they're going to be able to interact with your development team. That's the one thing I tell them is make sure your development team is coming to the meetup because you just don't want your recruiter standing up there and saying how great the company is because we all know that we can trust the recruiters, right? They're, they're not going to give us an overly rosy picture of the company. But if you have your developers there and you have conversations, like meaningful conversations with them and say, I can see myself working with this person, it turns out it's very effective. And as it turns out, your membership is also looking for jobs a lot. You know, we, in technology, we change jobs all the time. So it's good to have a, you know, a way for people to make those connections. And then growing your membership. So, um, one of the things that we learned, so you, once you get the venue and the speaker thing worked out, you've, you've basically achieved the basic Maslow um, order of needs. So you have speakers, you have venue, you have beer and pizza. So like from a sustainability perspective, if all you do is that, you're, you're at least going to live. Um, but once you're able to do that frequently, you can achieve like much higher levels where you get to have more fun. Um, and one of the things that you can do is get more involved. Um, so we started expanding our topic list to start covering like alternative languages. We started covering things that maybe weren't even technology topics necessarily, um, but were interests of our, uh, of our community. And um, 
what this did is it allowed us to start partnering with other groups. So if we did something on Scala, Chicago's got a Scala user group, we would partner with the Scala user group. And then we got to meet all the leaders in the Scala user group. The pie expanded for us again. Even with the fragmentation of the, the, develop, of the user group communities, we were able to kind of bridge that and partner with other user groups. Um, the other thing we did, and this is, this is Apache, but we did get involved in the JCP. So don't boo me off the stage right now. I know there's issues with Apache and the JCP. It's not an open process. But as a user group, getting involved in that process did give our developers a voice in, in what they wanted, or at least a way for us to communicate back to um, the JCP process of what was happening with, what our developers wanted with Java. Um, we also started working in Adopt a JSR, which allowed um, you know, us to get involved in some of the JSR spec writing processes and provide feedback on those things. So you know, you can, just like Apache in many ways, you know, we don't always, we, we don't dictate what people should and shouldn't do. We just kind of provide you know, the basic layout and say, okay, here's, here's the basic things, but you guys can take this where you want to go with it. All right. And finally, encouraging open source con contributions. So once you're getting involved, you have meetings, you have, you have speakers, the next step is let's try to get people building stuff. So what we found is um, a couple of things that we'll do. So holding hack nights where people are not just listening to speakers, but actually building things with their hands. And these can be Apache projects, you know, one, one thing we did last year was we did a hackathon with, on Apache Groovy. It was like, let's welcome Groovy to the ASF. They're new. Um, let's bring them in. And this could be done for any incubator project. Um, but the first time we did something like this, we found it was, it was difficult to figure out what people should be working on um, because some people were just like, well, I'm just learning Groovy. Um, so going through and curating some of the JIRAs, and this is actually something I've, I've heard in a number of talks so far, um, but it really does work. Going through a JIRA before you have the hack night and saying, you know, these are three, four, five JIRAs that we think, even if you're fairly junior, we might be able to get a pull request or a patch out in an evening, um, makes people feel really good about themselves. And again, it's that feeling that we're trying to propagate so that people are willing to make that next step and say, all right, I'm gonna try to do this more regularly or maybe on my own without people around. Uh, another thing we tried just this year is holding office hours. So these are hours where uh, we set aside and people can come uh, to us and we'll have, um, it'll just be open conversation. You can bring your project in. I'm trying to um, learn Spring Boot or I'm trying to make this work in Apache Camel and it's not working. Um, and it's not free consulting. There's really a limit to what you, know, you can get done, but it's only an evening. Right, And it's just however many people show up, it's a conversation. Um, and what I'd like to see this evolve into is almost like some pairing um, where people bring in their projects and, and we set aside the JIRAs even just for the office hours and do some hacking there for people to learn the language. The other thing is having talks on open source. Again, covering some of the things that people just don't know um, by default, um, like you know, what is my responsibility when I'm a committer? is extremely useful. What are the differences between joining one foundation like the ASF or joining Cloud Foundry or the Eclipse Foundation? Um, I did a talk earlier this year with, with one of my friends, Michael Manella, who works at Pivotal, and he talked about being a spring committer and how that works versus you know, what it would be like working in the ASF. And I kind of took the ASF perspective on things. You know, and there are differences that can be important if you're looking to get involved in it. Um, and so they don't have to be technical. You know, the, the talks just should cover, you know, hey, I'm interested. What, would, what do I need to know before I get involved? And then finally, encouraging other people to give talks. Again, the lightning talks and, being, and, and putting them in a position where they take that next step to learn the software well enough to give a talk on it, because this is actually what got me um, into user groups and Apache. Um, so getting an open source is a journey, and mine started about five years ago, being encouraged to get it into a talk. Um, it was on Apache Sling, and I thought I knew something about this open source project because I'd worked with it for a few years, but when I was trying to condense it into a talk, 
I ended up finding, oh wait, there's a bug in this release, or there was, there was something that didn't work in my talk the way I expected it to. And it started, you know, oh, well maybe I should sub a Jira for this. Um, and the funniest thing, the timing of this talk was exactly five years ago today. So it's kind of ironic being here and giving this talk five years after I started getting brought into this because there's another really significant thing that happened that day. And if you can think of all of the worst possible things, they're not worse, but interesting things that can happen when you're giving a talk. Um, this happened for me. So it's my five-year-old's birthday today. And uh, I got a call during the, or well, I got texted during my talk about my wife going to the hospital for him. Now, of course, it was covered up because my text messages were full. But I went off and uh, gave my talk, had a kid, and then started continuing to think about open source. So, but this is really why we do this, right? We have the ability to create software that's going to be used for a very, very, very long time. Um, and even if it dies and, you know, the, the processes and the things we have in place are important. So being able to bring people in to do the work and to have them understand what the value add is for them to do this for their career is really critical. Um, so this is me. These are some links to my podcast. Is anybody wondering, so you guys did math, right? So there's three of them there. I just had one last month. So is anybody like, wait a minute, you have four kids and you're involved in a user group and you contribute to open source and so how do you do that? So I kind of put this together because there, there, there's some things that are really important if you're a busy person and you want to get involved in these things. So this is, um, yeah, so how do you run a user group and get involved go to, and go to ApacheCon a month and a half later? Um, so basically I looked at it like a load test. So this is what it looks like right now. So this is my wife over here. She's got all four of them. I get to go to ApacheCon. And so far, this is working very well. She's a little bit overloaded. But in order to make this work long term, this is what happens after ApacheCon. Um, I'm not sure if I'm completely ready for the load over here. I might have to solve some device mapping issues. Um, but she gets to go away with her sister after, the, after this. So really the compromise thing, if you have a significant other that's like, why are you doing all of these things? Um, this is generally one way that you can make it work. So just keep that in mind if you're, if you're ever trying to sell these things to your wife or her husband uh, to try to balance them out a little bit. Um, and then you can do these things longer term. So um, that's all I got. And I, there should be some time for questions if you guys want to have, ask any questions. I, I was kind of hoping if, if, if anybody here is running a user group and they, they have things that they want to talk about, things that are working, things that aren't working, uh, would love to have that discussion. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, uh, you have thousands of members, how many people actually end up coming to the meetups? Um, so it varies per topic. And what we've found is um, the longer that we've been around, the worse the no-show rate actually got. And we also record everything. So that also has made the no-show rate go up. But what's really interesting is it's extremely consistent is we're always at right about 50%. So if we get, you know, our typical meetup is between 40 and 80 people, somewhere in that range. So if we get 80 signups, we know we're like right about the 40 mark. So if you're, if you're trying to work with a vendor and say, well, how much pizza and beer do we need? We just say, well, just cut it in half and we should be fine. It, it's one of those things that's held now for about two and a half years. So it's almost, we, we tried like making people feel guilty for not showing up. and It doesn't work. Um, the only time it really becomes an issue is if we do have hard limits and uh, we need to make sure that if people aren't going to show up, they deregister to make room for people that are actually going to show up, then we'll, we'll do a little guilt tripping. But for the, for the most part, uh, we're, we're right at that 50% show rate. It's a good question though. Um, but when you're just starting out, it, it's sometimes like 70%.
if you know everybody. Um, but that eventually goes away. Any other questions? Okay, well thank you very much.